Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's program. As we have a very special guest, uh, Keith Smith. Uh, Keith has, has spent a, a long career in Cooperative Extension and continues to contribute uh, to our system. He's served as the chair of the uh, Extension Committee on Organization and Policies Task Force on Innovation. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at The Ohio State University, and, and Keith uh, was the director of Ohio State University Extension for more than 20 years. It's, it's a great honor to welcome you to the podcast, Keith. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the kind introduction, Robert. Um, well, you know, since we started there with, with uh, looking back a little bit on, on your contributions to Extension, I wanted to start by asking about the Ohio Agricultural Hall of Fame, and you were inducted into that in August. Um, how, what, what was that experience like? How did that feel as a as sort of maybe somewhat of a culmination of, of all your years in Extension? Well, it came as a, a shock and a surprise. As you know, it's a, a nomination, and uh, one of my own assistant directors was the, the key. Matter of fact, uh, Tom Archer, who is the assistant director of 4-H uh, and youth development uh, for us here in, in Ohio, in, in our OSU Extension organization, um, put together the nomination, ask others uh, to add their letters of support. Uh, I appreciated that very much. It came as a complete surprise when they called me up and, and told me that I was going to be inducted into the Ohio uh, Agriculture Hall of Fame. Um, on the other hand, yes, it, it felt like um, some of the things that uh, we tried to accomplish here in Ohio were recognized. Uh, but I don't, I don't take the credit to, to myself. Uh, it was the, all these good people that uh, I've surrounded, I surrounded myself with um, over the years. Uh, some excellent uh, administrators. Uh, and of course, our our extension educators, uh, I I thought were some of the best in in, in the nation. So, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll take the plaque, but I I give the credit <laughs> to all our good people here in Ohio. Uh, well, you know, it's I, well, it's well deserved, first of all, and and I've I've appreciated your uh, sort of forward thinking attitude in in my years uh, working with Cooperative Extension in the last eight years, and and so just want to thank you for for your contributions uh, to cooperative extension you continue to do that even uh, after retirement um, serving as the chair of the ecop uh, innovation tax task force um, why do you agree to take that on well um, my wife asked that question <laughs> <laughs> Uh, she says uh, you know that's going to take a lot of time and you're retired and uh, I said yes uh, that will take a lot of time. Michelle Rogers uh, called me up. It, it came as a result. We had been asked, and this is when I was still director uh, in extension uh, uh, here at Ohio State University. Uh, we were asked to put together a, a kind of a little research um, on innovative things that are going on in extension. So I also had the, uh, I was chair of the, the, the guest chair uh, in leadership uh, here at Ohio State, and then I had some graduate students working with me, and uh, I got them involved, and we put together a, a little uh, survey that we sent out uh, to all of the uh, extension directors across the country, so they had a little survey that they answered. Then we had follow-up um, direct conversations with these directors uh, across the country, Put together that information, shared it with ECOP uh, in their in their national meeting uh, in 2015, and it basically shared with ECOP all the innovative things that are going on in, in extension right now. And my question: Do we want innovation to continue? And of course, it was a resounding yes with the uh, the directors. And so that report was shared with ECOP, and then Michelle, after I had shared the report, came back to me and, and said, Keith, uh, we really liked the survey and the information. Um, we've, 
we're taking your recommendation because the recommendation as a result of the ta of that survey, of that uh, research was you ECOP needs to take some action. And one of our suggestions was to form a task force. And she says, we want to form a task force. And, and guess who we want to chair the, the task force? <laughs> and I said, oh, Michelle, that's, uh, that's quite a bit of work. But I guess because I have such a passion uh, for innovation, uh, we had, as you suggested, we had tried some, a number of things in, in Ohio. Uh, here again, I give credit to our people here in Ohio that uh, were innovative and creative. Uh, you know Jamie, and, and we've got a number of, of Jamies in our or organization that just uh, are very innovative and creative. And... And so it's been a passion of mine. I, I had our administrative cabinet read a book uh, by Hill uh, entitled uh, Genius, the Art of Innovation. And uh, we took that over a, a number of months to, to read through that and instill more innovation in our own organization. And so why not instill it in a national uh, group as well? So I got excited about it and said, yeah, I'd like to be involved in this kind of give back. Uh, Extension's done so much for me and our state. Uh, let's let's try to share that uh, in a national way as well. Hope that isn't too long of an answer, but uh, that's kind of how it came about. Why do you think innovation is important? I mean, you know, it's a it's can be tend to be a buzzword, especially in the last, you know, five or 10 years in, in business. And um, to those people who might say, or might, might be thinking, you know what, we're doing a good job. Extension's doing a great job. Why don't we just keep pushing the ball forward, doing what we're doing? Why do we have to, you know, be coming up with new ways of doing it? What, what would your answer to that be? Well, I guess my answer would be the United States feels like they're pretty innovative too. And yet, uh, I, I added in our report that uh, the heads of nine large U.S. corporations, John Deere, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Merrick, and Microsoft, uh, issued a call to action uh, called the Innovation Imperative in 2015, urging Congress to enact policies and make investments to ensure, to ensure that the United States remains the global innovation leader. And I said, if, if, the if the nation and our corporations are saying we need to uh, make sure in, and ensure that we're going to be innovative in the future, then wake up, Congress, and enact some of these things that make sure that that's still going to continue in our corporations in the future. My charge to ECOP, uh, again, in, in this report, is if if you, uh, all these corporations feel like we still need to make sure we're going to be innovative, how can we be any less uh, motivated uh, by that charge as well in extension that we need uh, to also ensure that we're going to be innovative in the future? I am not saying that extension is not innovative at the current time, and we have wonderful uh, examples of that across the, the United States, and I shared those at the national meeting, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, through our survey. But if we're going to remain uh, innovative, then we need to put things into, into practice that are going to keep us on that cutting edge. Do you think it's more difficult for extension or really any institution, you know, who, in the case of extension, are not necessarily even just our mission, but uh, but some of our method is defined in legislation in the Smith Lever Act. Um, you know, to diffuse information, to diffuse innovation, um, sort of suggests a method of actually going about things. It, does it does that make it harder for us to be innovative than say you know a private company who can you know switch their focus tomorrow? Excellent question. And do I call you Robert or Bob? Bob is fine. <laughs> I want to make sure I'm, that uh, you're comfortable with uh, my response. Uh, Bob, um, yes. I would, um, without hesitation, say yes, it might be a little more difficult. 
And matter of fact, that's why in the report, one of our major areas of study is how do we, how do we create innovation in our clientele? How do we engage our clientele in innovation? How do we uh, encourage them uh, in the innovation process? Exactly, because they're used to, okay, extension is a certain way. This is the way extension does their business. And we're saying maybe that's not the way that we need our to do our business in the future. And you need to help us, clientele, uh, in the innovative approaches that, that we need to use. Uh, yes, some of the traditionalists we reach in certain ways, but we've got a brand new set of people that are coming in online now uh, that maybe want their information a little bit different. And maybe they want their programming a little bit different. And maybe want, they want their contact, uh, contact, uh, content put into a different uh, package. And so that's where I'm coming from is that, uh, yes, uh, it might be a little more difficult. And yes, that's why we need to involve our clientele in this process as well. Uh, might be a little more of a challenge for us, but I think the end result is going to be more positive if we instill the innovation process into our into the people we serve as well. Let's talk a little bit about that engagement. You know, we interviewed Chuck Hibbard a, a few weeks ago, and uh, in Nebraska, UNL Extension is is really putting a focus on what they're calling learner engagement. Is this you know, do you see this as, you, you sort of mentioned it's kind of important to our innovation and moving forward is to actually involve our clientele, our learners into the process. Can you comment any more about that? And Chuck Hibbert, good friend, worked with him a number of years in the, in the North Central, both when he was at Purdue and uh, at Nebraska. And uh, I look as uh, Chuck as one of the innovative leaders in our, in our country. And I completely agree with him on learner engagement. And that's, again, why it's in, in the report and so important uh, that, that we involve uh, our learners, those we work with uh, in this innovation process. I, did, I think it's vital. Let's talk a little bit about the task force uh, process. Um, obviously, there were a lot of meetings. Can you kind of describe um, what the process was for the folks involved in the task force? Sure. And I guess that's a little innovative in itself. We had one face-to-face -face meeting. That was uh, last March in San Antonio, Texas. And so the, I felt like it was important for all of us at least to get in the same room, look at each other, um, kind of understand where uh, each was coming from. But after that, it was all uh, Zoom, like we're doing today. Zoom meetings, box, emails, Twitter, Instagram, you name it, uh, we were in, involved. What I need to point out is, is how involved the task force was. Uh, we had 13 members on this task force that were uh, all engaged. And uh, 70 to 80% participation on the Zoom meetings uh, that we had. If they were not able to get on the Zoom meetings, they would add their comments uh, to the box that we had set up. Uh, as far as the draft reports that we got out, uh, all interacted and reacted uh, to, to the reports. They had read it through, they understood it, um, and they were making excellent uh, uh, comments in, in regard to, to the report. I was just thrilled with the engagement of the task force. And you, boy, to think since March, clear to uh, the end of August, it was basically about every other week, it was tw at least twice a month that we were on these Zoom meetings and people would connect and interact. We sent out questions ahead of time that, that we asked the, them to interact with. We sent out, uh, they were asked to read the book uh, by Hill, they were asked to read another little book, a little black book on innovation by Anthony. They, I, were, I gave them a stack of articles on innovation and uh, that they were uh, to read through all different types of uh, uh, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, etc. Um, 
to read through those articles, innovation and leadership, uh, inter- change, changing culture, uh, change process, et cetera, all these type of articles they were sent out. And, and they, I know they read them or they wouldn't have interacted the way they did uh, in our Zoom meetings. So they were hungry, they were eager, uh, great discussion, um, great input in, into the report. And so I thought, here again, the process was a little different, um, being mostly completely done through these new innovative techniques. But I think the final, uh, well, we haven't got the final result yet. We've got a rough draft, but ECOP was very pleased with, uh, with the rough draft. So, so far, so good. You mentioned uh, culture as being one of those uh, areas that you guys address in the report and, and that's important to innovation. What are the parts of the culture, either in your experience uh, in extension through your career or that you might see nationally? Um, what are the parts of the extension culture that might be holding us back a little bit from innovating? Here again, a good question. Back up a uh, couple of three years. Um, this is another little research that I did through the GIST chair uh, with North Central directors. We, uh, uh, we asked the North Central directors if they would mind being engaged in a culture uh, study. And uh, 10, 10 of the 12 states were involved. The other two states uh, already had some studies that they were doing. So we added those kind of in to the, to the 10 that we were working with. Um, we asked them uh, these questions uh, related to culture, um, uh, Shine's process, three-stage process that, that uh, talks about uh, going through different stages and different um, uh, parts of the change process, using some of Cotter's work, his eight-stage uh, process on, on, on change. And uh, we, we put together this, uh, this package that we sent out to the North Central directors. And we got that information back and I shared it uh, with the North Central uh, directors. They liked it so well, they asked me to come back the next year. Okay, now what do we do as a result? And so we had suggestions uh, for them. Here again, using Shine is three stage uh, process. Okay, if, if this is where you are with, uh, with your culture right now, how do you go about changing uh, the culture? Uh, to make a long story short, and we gave them some tools that they could use in, in changing the culture of the organization. Now, what did we find out? And you, this gets to your question. Okay, what do we need to change in our uh, in our culture and extension? What was interesting, very interesting, and this was across the board, all ten states, and really all twelve states, uh, including Ohio, uh, which. <laughs> Uh, which I was a little bit chagrined at, but uh, still, as, as we looked at all the questions that were asked, the question that stood out as a red flag in all 12 states was, uh, are our educators slash agents um, willing, wanting to make change or to involve themselves in the change process? That was the lowest rated area uh, of all the different areas. Uh, we look at programming, we look at involvement in clientele, we look at these other areas that, uh, that we looked at in the change process, all rated very high compared to this national comparison that we did at all uh, these corporations. This, this was in a database that 5 million people had participated in, 5,000 corporations, and we rated very high in learner involvement and in programming, all very good. Mission vision, pretty high there too. But our area of weakness was our propensity to change, our willingness to change. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, 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 here again, it's, it, it's, um, it was kind of interesting to me that we're classified as change agents <laughs> and, and we're sitting here a little less eager uh, to change. And so uh, what we were saying to the North Central directors and what we were saying to ECOP as well, and that was one of the areas that we studied uh, 
uh, in our uh, innovation report too was changing the culture in extension. What are the steps? What are the recommendations that we need to take in, in changing the culture in extension? Extension has a wonderful culture. Don't get me wrong. The, the family uh, feeling, uh, the supportive uh, help others to help themselves type of feel that we have in extension. Don't want to go away from that. But what we do want to change is our willingness to adjust, be agile, uh, and to make those quick adjustments that we need to in order to meet the needs of our clientele. And so that was an interesting result of the study and your to your question, what do we need to do to be a little more innovative is we need to be more able to adjust, adapt, be agile, and to change when we need to change. It seems like there's, and maybe this is kind of going to, you know, an earlier question I, I talked about, you know, extension as an institution too, that there seems to be tension uh, between that uh, in extension as an institution because of our need to change or even our feeling that we might need to, that we want to change, but that we have clientele who have become to view us a certain way and rely on us to do certain things. Um, how do we resolve that tension? <laughs> what's the magic bullet? Yeah, what's the magic bullet, uh, Bob? It's an excellent question. And yes, that here again, that's why that's in the report and working with our clientele. You said it well. Is it going, it's not going to be as easy for us uh, as maybe uh, a corporation, correct? I, I fully agree. And to, uh, Engage our clientele is going to require a lot of work, but I keep coming back to if we do, if we can, and if our clientele, people we work with, our volunteers uh, get involved, then Johnny Bar the Door, I think, uh, will pass these corporations as far as our ability to innovate if we get others on board. To a, to a large extent, um, I see it already in the organization. Uh, a lot of what we're doing in 4-H, uh, the wonderful things that I see there are, are, are very innovative in what we're, how we're working with the youth. Here again, youth, is, <laughs> they're willing to change, adjust. And uh, as you know how uh, 4-H came to be, it was because uh, Parents, fathers, mothers, corn clubs, canning clubs, uh, type of thing were started. And, and parents saw how successful their kids were from following the recommendations uh, of the university. Uh, we wanted to have some of that advice, too. So I, I think if we get some people on board, and maybe it starts with our 4-H program, but I've seen some innovative things in our family consumer sciences, our community development, our ag and natural resources, the, we get some of those people involved. I mean, we have some innovative farmers. We have uh, some uh, master gardeners uh, that are uh, innovative. I mean, they're out there, and they're willing to go with us on this innovation project. <laughs> but it, it is. It's going to require a little more work. From, a, from your personal standpoint, was there anything throughout this innovation task force process that you found you know, particularly insightful to you or rewarding, not necessarily from a system standpoint, uh, but just anything that you were surprised by or, or found really uh, uh, inspiring in going through this process? Yes. Uh, and I mentioned that at the ECOP meeting, uh, it was just completed in Jackson Hole as well. What I was thrilled with is the, the younger people that are in our system. And we had a number of these on the task force, the Jamies, the Hunters, the Brad, um, Paul, uh, that, that were just uh, Johnny on the spot, always with us, eager, uh, contributing. Um, and, and I mentioned this, these millennials that we have, that we had on our task force um, were inspiring to me. They love extension. They want it to be successful. 
they're willing to put their time, extra time and effort into it uh, to make sure it's successful. That was one of the major light bulbs, uh, the epiphanies that, that I had. Wow, uh, I didn't understand the commitment to extension and the love of extension and some of these uh, younger people uh, in our organization. That was inspiring to me, just fun and inspiring. What do you hope uh, the report accomplishes? How do you see uh, you know, state systems using it and to you know, uh, spur on change? Well, <laughs> you know, as I said, when I was director and, and, and we do our five-year plans, and that was the thing to, to do when, uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, and through the 90s was those strategic planning efforts. And, and I was always diligent in making sure we were always renewing, re-looking uh, at ourselves. Um, and the worst thing that could happen is to have something set on a shelf. And so we were constantly reminding our people, this is what we decided in our strategic plan. This is what we accomplished uh, as a result of our strategic plan. And this is what I, uh, I told ECOP. Uh, this was my final words, my final slide, <laughs> that uh, now is the time. We have the fire. We have the passion. We've got these young people. They're excited about our organization. Let's take these recommendations and let's do something with it. Uh, a report that sits on the shelf after we've had all this uh, eagerness is just wrong. And so we need to move out and, and, and try some of these recommendations. All of them, I'm, you know, I, I know that's not going to happen. But we have a number of recommendations in each one of the areas that we identified. Let's take uh, the priorities in each one of these areas and start to work on those. And so that's my hope. Well, thanks so much, Keith, for joining us. And thanks uh, for your work uh, on the Innovation Task Force and throughout your career as uh, an incredible leader in extension. Well, that's very kind of you, Bob. And thank you for the interview. Uh, if there's you know, I want to, to get this message out to the system, and I appreciate uh, you uh, wanting to let this uh, get out uh, in uh, to the system. And if, uh, if that can help in any way, I, I hope it does to inspire others that, uh, yes, we need to be in the business of constantly uh, improving ourselves and looking towards uh, innovation in our system. Keith Smith was the chair of the Task Force on Innovation for the Extension Committee on Organization and Policy, ECOP. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at The Ohio State University and former director of Ohio State University Extension for more than 20 years. Thanks so much for joining us, listeners. Uh, hit us up on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. The Twitter handle is at WDNEXT. You can find all of the podcasts at soundcloud.com slash working differently. Show notes, including links to some of the books that Keith talked about today, will be at Bob Birch. Com. The Working Differently in Extension theme music is Noon's Acid by And Nobody Cared. It's used under a Creative Commons license, and you can download it on Gemendo, gemendo.com. Thanks again for joining us. Have a great day.